Um, all right, so uh, uh, hardware talk. Um, what I'd like to present is a, um, a hardware that I think has a lot of potential for reaching fault tolerance uh, that's, that's a little bit new and that we're trying to develop experimentally at Stanford. Um, mostly we're working on still developing uh, qubits, but I'd like to see a full architecture built around this. So I've teamed up with uh, computer architects, Rodney Van Meter uh, at KO and, and Austin Fowler at IQC. And the architecture aspect is still very much uh, in progress. Mostly what I'll, um, what I'll talk about today is uh, the, the basic element around which this is built, um, this so-called hybrid cubus element. And as I go, I'll explain why I think um, it may be a very uh, practical technology for reaching fault tolerance. Um, much of the uh, core work that I've done has been modeling the specific gates using this uh, using this construction. Unfortunately, I won't have time to talk about a lot of this, but I think some people are interested in this aspect, these uh, decoherence-optimized geometric two-qubit gates via shape pulses. So I'll, I'll spend some time on that. I'll show what results we have for architecture so far, and then with what is probably very little time remaining, I'll um, maybe show some experimental pictures of what we have so far. OK, so this basic uh, hardware element um, it's based on this fast type of Q and D measurement in which you have a qubit that's encoded in the two ground states of an optical lambda system. So they're both connected to a single um, excited state, but one of them is more optically connected than the other. So that if a off-resonant optical pulse comes along and interacts with this system, um, it will be just a little bit more slowed down if this qubit is in state one than if it's in state zero. And so uh, if you look at the optical phase, um, that optical phase will become entangled to the state of the qubit. And we call this hybrid because it's a mixture of the discrete quantum variable of the qubit and the continuous quantum variable um, of the optical pulse. Now this type of, uh, oh, and then you can of course measure the qubit um, in a way that doesn't destroy it by just measuring this optical phase through something like homodyne detection. And this kind of uh, measurement has been done before. Probably the most famous experiment is um, uh, Jeff Kimball's experiment, who did a version of this over 10 years ago with atoms falling through a cavity. Uh, much more recently, it's been done um, uh, by David Oshlam's group for a quantum dot in a micro cavity. And that's very akin to the uh, technology I'll be talking about as we go. So uh, the next step is to use the same measurement scheme in order to make um, half of a, of a logic gate, a probabilistic logic gate. So the same thing happens. This, this pulse comes and interacts with a single one of these qubits, gets entangled to some phase shift, interacts with a second qubit. And if the two qubits are identical, then one particular choice of two phase shifts um, corresponds to the uh, odd parity subspace. And you can't tell which qubit was in state one, which one was in state zero. So it effectively projects you into this uh, subspace. So if you, uh, if you happen to measure within some finite post-selection window a phase shift close to zero, then that can project you into an entangled state. Now, there are many, many ways to do this kind of uh, post-selected um, post projection. Uh, some of the advantages of this one are, are really technological. The, um, the demands of the qubit are actually fairly small. Uh, the, the cavity, in particular, doesn't need to be in strong coupling regime. It doesn't need to be particularly high Q, because this is really dealing with very small phase shifts. Now, as this is the uh, kind of critical element of the uh, of the architecture, I take a moment to um, point out its main failing, i.e. its error model. Um, if the gate succeeds, then this is effectively what happens to the density matrix. There are, there are two basic types of error models, and which one is important depends on how many photons are in that optical pulse. If it's a, it's a very small number of photons, then you don't successfully determine the phase that projects into the even parity versus odd parity subspace. So these J errors come in that, that have um, even parity subspace terms. And that's in this re regime of, of kind of fidelity versus number of photons times the strength of the interaction. Uh, but if you put in too many photons so that you can resolve that phase extremely well, then another error comes in, and that's due to optical loss. Because every photon that um, is, uh, is lost on that channel reveals some information, and that's effectively a cause of decoherence. So as you go to very high loss, uh, again, uh, one's entanglement fidelity goes down. And so there's a cap there, and where that cap is depends on the total amount of loss in the system. This is actually for a rather large amount of loss corresponding to 10 kilometers of fiber or, or several meters of, of, of light traveling on an optical chip. If, uh, if you're making a computer out of this on some local chip, then that loss can be made quite low. 
Uh, also, that post selection window um, is a free parameter that allows you to trade off to some degree how much fidelity you want versus how much probability of success that you want. Um, it also turns out to trade off some of the uh, types of noise that you have in the system. Okay, so this isn't an architecture, but it's just a concept of how to take this basic element and, um, and proceed forward to make a, a computer out of it. Imagine that you have some long bus, some long waveguide bus, and you input a very fast train of pulses. And then these pulses can allow you to, to move or to generate entanglement from any qubit over here to any qubit over there. Uh, also, they can be switched into these ring-type waveguides that allow them to, to uh, interact adjacently between or alternatingly between one qubit and another. Uh, one of the key uh, underlying principles for developing this, this hardware is, is speed. Uh, these pulses can come in very, very fast, perhaps one every uh, 10 picoseconds in, in modern semiconductor mode lock lasers. And this interaction of one pulse with this one qubit can also correspond to a pulse length of about 10 picoseconds. Um, the uh, switching of qubits on and off can be done by, uh, by control beams that are focused from above. Um, such control beams can, can shift cavities in and out of resonance with the light, hence turning cavities on and off also on that same 10 picosecond time scale. Um, I also won't have a chance to talk about how single uh, femtosecond pulses can be used to do uh, single qubit rotations in this case. Um, I haven't specified yet what this thing is made out of. Uh, and that's really where the experimental uh, developments have to lie, and I'll get to that only at the end of the talk. Uh, so what I'd like to uh, discuss now is uh, I've talked about a probabilistic way to, to, to generate entanglement from one place to another, but that's pretty far from computation. So the two things we need are, are um, how, to, uh, how to use that probabilistic gate in an effective way to, to reach an architecture, and also how to do uh, deterministic gates of high fidelity, because if you don't have at least some of those, it's almost hopeless. So uh, before I do that, though, let me just say what I think the biggest advantage of this technology is, at least from my point of view, and that is its connection to uh, devices that are being engineered for other reasons. It's not clear who's going to put all these, uh, all these many pieces together into a, into a quantum computer any time in the near future. But fortunately, all these pieces are already being assembled for, for classical computers. This is a plot from Intel for how long they think these kinds of uh, integrated, for, for when they think these kinds of integrated microphotonic circuits are going to be used not just for uh, uh, large distance internet, but even chip-to-chip -chip communication in a, in a single computer. So it's nice to think that in the distant future when we start replacing our classical computers with quantum computers, many of these, uh, um, many of these components will already be engineered. So this, this, this chip, which is a prototype optical interconnect from a company called Luxterra, actually contains all of the elements in that uh, concept diagram, or most of the elements. It has um, integrated uh, high-speed semiconductor lasers, uh, integrated on-chip detectors. It's got these, uh, these waveguides based on uh, silicon on oxide. It's got these uh, little ring waveguides used for multiplexing and demultiplexing. These are all transistors for classical logic. It pretty much has everything you need except, uh, except qubits. We're working on that part. So, um, so let me talk now about how to do a deterministic gate using these same, uh, same resources. Um, this is based on the type of geometric gate that's been uh, developed a lot by uh, Paolo Zanardi here, as well as by my uh, co-workers, Kindemoto and Bill Monroe. Uh, they work on these kinds of um, uh, complicated pulse sequences in order to generate geometric phase gates. So, so the idea is, let's start on the right here. This is a phase space diagram of the path taken by light in an optical cavity that contains two qubits, or that's connected to two qubits. And uh, if the path taken depends on the state of the two qubits, then the area enclosed by that path um, tells you a, a geometric phase that accrues. And for, for example, if you go 1, 1, that's an opposite sign area than if you go 0, 1. And so this gate would give you overall a, a controlled phase gate. And to do a controlled displacement, that's a little hard because it means that the, depending on the state of the qubit, you're injecting energy into the cavity. Uh, but here's a way to do it that only uses these um, energy conserving controlled phase shifts. You do a, a constant displacement, a dependent controlled phase shift, another constant displacement, and then with the same qubit, another controlled phase shift, and then back again. Uh, as you can see, this gets really complicated. If you try to design an optical experiment around this idea, 
uh, you quickly um, you quickly want to hide in a corner. So I've been working. Um, oh, it has another problem as well, and that is that it's extremely intolerant to loss. If you try to do this in a real cavity, it's just simply not going to work. So I've been. Um, uh, one, one area of focus has been finding these kinds of geometric phase gates that are based on single shape pulses and that are also optimized against decoherence. So uh, as an example, um, this is a set of the same kind of paths in phase space for two qubits. This green path is if you're in the, um, if you're in that odd parity subspace and then you go around this loop and you develop some phase. In contrast, if you're in um, state 1, 1, or state 0, 0, you do some very tightly closed path that approves almost no area at all. Um, and that achieves the necessary gate. That is a very simple pulse shape given by this uh, red curve in the Fourier domain. And this is against some optimizing function that just tries to reduce the total amount of optical power that you need. Uh, so it, 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 it works, and it allows you to do that whole gate with just one single shape pulse, and a fairly simple pulse at that. But um, the problem is it's still very intolerant to loss. If you started your qubits off in a fully, uh, uh, completely uh, symmetric superposition state, then the off-diagonal elements decay by as much as 40%, which is obviously intolerable. Um, if instead of optimizing against power, you optimize against decoherence, um, then you get a different kind of path. It turns out that decoherence is related to the integrated distance between the, the different paths. So if the paths follow each other a little bit better, that decoherence is, is much improved. And this, these parameters are for a fairly uh, heroic cavity with low loss. If you increase the loss, this is for a cavity with a loss um, divided by the, uh, uh, the nonlinearity uh, being compar comparable. And if you allow very, very large detuning, so you can get very close to fidelity one. And if you look at the path that, that this corresponds to, this, this optimized solution, mostly the paths are following each other completely for the different qubit states and only varying once they get to this, this extremum of the path. Okay, so. You can also use this optimization to, um, to work with uh, cavities uh, that are connected to each other. So here's one main ring, guide, uh, ring waveguide kind of cavity, which is evanescently coupled to another couple of cavities, each made in qubits. So there are at least three modes that you need to, to optimize against. But still, you can define some optimizing function, find a pulse that works well with it, and uh, define these closed paths that are optimized against decoherence. OK, so uh, let's go now to how to paste these things together. Um, I actually worked for quite some time uh, trying to develop an architecture based on more traditional fault tolerance with encilofactories and syndrome measurements and all that. And then once I started talking to uh, my coworkers, they said, throw all that away. The way to go is, uh, is uh, cluster state topological fault tolerance, as we heard about this morning. So I did indeed throw all that away and then just um, started wondering how quickly I could make a cluster state out of an array of these kinds of cavities. So here's the, here's the idea. You, these, are, these red dots indicate small micro cavities with a Q of maybe about 1,000, and each containing a single qubit. Um, and they are connected by these ring guide cavities in order to achieve these um, geometric phase gates. And uh, that gate is completely deterministic. It doesn't require any measurement. Um, and can be achieved by a very strong shape pulse that proceeds down this waveguide and then just couples weakly into each of these cavities. And what's really nice about that is that it can all be done in parallel to achieve nearest neighbor couplings in the vertical direction. The problem is, in the horizontal direction, we can't just have a, you know, a street grid of waveguides because they can't effectively cross unless you introduce a network of switches, which are very lossy and problematic for many reasons. So to go in the horizontal direction, we rely on this um, entanglement mechanism that I presented at the beginning, uh, and then up its fidelity using, using purification. And you need many qubits in order to do that purification quickly. And unfortunately, these qubits all need to live on the same waveguide. And as that waveguide gets larger and larger, its loss also increases quite a lot. Um, so it's, it's beneficial not to use those, those geometric phase gates, which are, are not nearly as tolerant to loss, but rather to use these deterministic uh, or these non-deterministic parity gates. Uh, and so you can, you can um, glue some of those, uh, uh, those parity gates together. It's very similar to uh, fusion gates in linear optics, if you've uh, looked at linear optics architectures, um, in order to make a, uh, a controlled knot gate for, for purification. Uh, and so you 
generate, you do a, a lot of purification, you generate this ancilla in order to, uh, to telegate your control Z, and then you can do deterministic control Z between your data qubits. So here's uh, an estimate for how many pulses you need in order to um, generate a cluster across the whole computer. It's actually limited by the number of, uh, it's limited by pulse congestion. So to translate this to real time, you need to know how quickly your pulses can come in. And here's where speed is a real advantage. Because as I said, these pulses can come in every 100 picoseconds, 10 to 100 picoseconds. So this might be upper bounded by a second. Uh, still, to get a very fast uh, computer, uh, you want to be in a, in a very low loss regime. So uh, I see Jake is standing up. And as I suspected, I don't actually have time to talk about anything experimental. So uh, I just want to show you a couple pictures. Um, maybe not that one. Here, here's, here's what we have of this computer so far. Here's one of these micro disc cavities. Here's another one. Here's one of these waveguides. These have um, indium arsenide uh, quantum dots inside a gallium arsenide matrix. Um, the problem with, um, in, with those quantum dots is, is decoherence due to nuclei. So I'm, I'm thinking that uh, silicon will be a much more useful material. And um, this is uh, a, a, one of these ring waveguides in silicon, which has a Q that's about 3 times 10 to the 6 which is certainly high enough for these type of geometric phase gates. OK, so please go forward. Uh, to conclude, I uh, introduced a kind of hardware. It's very similar to linear optics. Uh, but unlike linear optics, it has memory. And it has nearly perfect detectors, because it's based on measurement of very, very bright optical pulses. Um, and in this way, I think it will be a very practical route towards scalability. Uh, I didn't get much of a chance to talk about experimental work. Uh, and the high-speed construction of cluster states, which we've now focused on, it still depends on optical loss, as, as it does in, in, uh, in linear optics, uh, but in a very uh, different and I, and, I think, more robust way. Thank you very much. So this is a, um, this would be a very nice semiconductor to get working well. It's zinc selenide. It has the advantage that gallium arsenide quantum dots have in that the, uh, the qubits, which are in this case fluorine impurities in the zinc selenide, are very optically bright like a quantum dot. But like silicon, um, the, uh, the nuclei can be removed. So as in uh, Steve Lyons' experiments, you can in principle get very long uh, decoherence times, um, not, not limited by, by nuclear diffusion. Uh, Unfortunately, zinc selenide has a long way to go before it reaches the kind of microphotonics people do in silicon. Um, the, this, all this data that I'm not going to explain has to do with recent development of microdisc lasers that we've been developing using these fluorine impurities in zinc selenide. If there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again.